Now, the traditional view of this, as I said, up to the 1840s was, yes, Congress had the power to regulate the territories. The Missouri Compromise had shown this. Some people said they should bar slavery, they shouldn't, but nobody doubted their power to do so. But in the 1840s, two other positions emerge very powerfully. One is a position put forward by John C. Calhoun, the great pro-slavery theorist, senator from South Carolina, that the territories are the common property of all the states. And therefore, all the people of all the states must have equal right to bring themselves and their property into those. In other words, Congress has no right to bar slavery from the territories any, way, any more than it would have the right to bar Northerners from bringing their property into the territories. So the, this, this sort of abrogates the notion. In fact, Southerners will increasingly say in the 1850s, not only can Congress not bar slavery, but it must protect slavery there. If Local people don't want slavery. Congress has to pass laws protecting the institution of slavery. Eventually, they say a state can abolish it. They knew that this is understood. A state can either have it or not. But in the territorial state as status, Congress has to make sure slave owners' rights are protected. And then the third point of view, which emerges in the late 1840s, is what we'll, we will come to call popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty. That is to say, Congress should do nothing about the territories in this issue. It should allow the people of the territory to decide for themselves. That seems kind of democratic, right? Why should far away Washington, D.C. tell people in Colorado whether they should have slavery or not? Let the people there decide. In other words, the territories are like mini states already, even though they're not really states. Just as a state can abolish slavery or establish slavery if it wants, so the territories should be able to do that. This has a tremendous appeal to a lot of people. It takes slavery out of national politics. People in Washington don't have to debate about slavery if we say, leave it up to the local inhabitants. Um, that becomes the official position of the Democratic Party, and it's a you see, it's a position that both Northerners and Southerners, it seems, can agree upon to just kick the slavery issue out from national politics into uh, local politics. Now, the, in our reading list, uh, Ashworth, John Ashworth's book, gives us a portrait of the political system in, at the beginning, in, around 1850 or around that period, mid-century. Um, I'm not going to repeat all that he says, but um, both Whigs and Democrats, the two major parties, have strong northern and southern wings. They're national parties. They both have a vested interest in keeping the slavery issue out of national politics. It's divisive within their own uh, political structures. Um, and, um, but it's a little different north and south. In the south, even though Whigs and Democrats differ on a lot of issues, they do not differ about slavery. They are both all Southern politicians are committed to protecting the interests of slavery, although how you go about doing that, they may differ uh, on that question. In the North, many politicians don't say a word about slavery. It's not an issue in the North, and um, it's not an issue between the parties. Northern Whigs, for various reasons, tend to be more anti-slavery than Northern Democrats, but not always. And generally speaking, in most Northern political campaigns, slavery is not really an issue. It, you know, why, why should it be? Um, but there were anti growing numbers of anti-slavery political groups in the North. There was the Liberty Party, very small but growing, which represented the abolitionists. Abolitionists who wanted to work in politics formed the Liberty Party to run, not to get elected, but to run candidates in order to raise the issue. But that's abolition is the issue they're raising, not necessarily the territories. Um, Northern Whigs and Northern Democrats both had factions which were anti-slavery and wanted to stop and resented what they considered Southern control of the national government. Um, and those in 1848, in the election, the presidential election of 1848, which is right after the Mexican War is concluded, um, Oh, I should actually show you one of our, let's see, we should show you, before we get off the Mexican War, there's James K. Polk, the president 
under who the Mexican War was initiated and conducted, James K. Polk of Tennessee. Um, clever guy. He got into office in 1845. He said, I'm only serving one term. He sort of announced himself a lame duck to begin with. But that actually gave him tremendous freedom. He said, I, he came in, here's what I want to do. I want to acquire Oregon, which he did. I want to acquire California. He said, wait a minute, California belongs to some other country, you know? How do you just say acquire? He said, no, no, forget it, I'm acquiring it. I don't care what they say. <laughs> and he did, he invaded Mexico and got a hold of California and a lot of the rest of Mexico. He said, I'm reducing the tariff, and he did. And so he accomplished what he set out to do. Um, Good-looking guy. I should say that Polk was a killer as a plantation owner. There's a book uh, that was published a couple of years ago at Polk as a Tennessee slave owner, and the death rate on his plantation was far higher than almost any other place in the South. I don't know what the heck he was doing down there, but uh, he was a brutal, vicious slave owner and uh, with an extremely high death rate on his plantation. But anyway, Northern Democrats came to resent, or many of them Polk, because they thought he had pulling the party into a pro-Southern uh, direction. And F Polk, Polk is nominated, but in 1848, the Whigs nominate Zachary Taylor, a Louisiana slave owner, sugar plantation owner, who was a leading general, a military hero from the Mexican War. Even though most Whigs were opposed to the Mexican War, uh, north and south, um, they nominated Taylor, and they nominated him even without a party platform. They couldn't agree on this slavery issue, so that there was no political position the Whigs stood for in 1848 except elect Taylor. He's a military hero. What else do you need to know? The Democrats nominated Lewis Cass of Michigan, who stood for this popular sovereignty, leave it up to the local people, and dissidents, the, the groups that I mentioned, Anti-slavery Democrats, anti-slavery Whigs, and the Liberty Party in the North came together. They didn't like either of these candidates, and they formed a new third party called the Free Soil Party. And they nominated for president, former president, Martin Van Buren of New York, and as vice president, Charles Francis Adams of Massachusetts, the son and grandson of presidents, the son of John Quincy and, and then the grandson of John Adams. So here you had two very respectable politicians, very mainstream, about as mainstream as you can get, Van Buren and Adams, one a Democrat, one a Whig, joining together with abolitionists in a party, the Free Soil Party, whose platform calls for the non-extension of slavery. But also, interestingly, adds the word free soil takes on another meaning here. They add into their platform the so-called homestead homestead provision. That is, the federal government should give free land to settlers in the West. Free of slavery and free of charge. That's what free soil means. So, and of course, that would keep slave plantations out if all these farmers went and took up. So, now I have to say, um, I have a sentimental interest in the Free Soil Party because um, uh, my, my senior thesis at Columbia ages ago was about the Free Soil Party. I have to admit, though, that it's obscure and boring. So <laughs> I will not say that much about it, except it did have an important role it brief, in its brief life in the politics. One, as I say, its candidates were established figures, not outsiders. Two, it begins this process of linking anti-slavery with economic self-interest. The abolitionists didn't care about economics. Forget it. They, they thought it was crass to talk. They were talking about morality. They didn't care about the tariff or about the homestead. Yeah, if it would help anti-slavery, I'll be happy to talk about it, but that's not of interest to them. Now you get a position where anti-slavery is becoming linked with the economic self-interest of large numbers of Northerners. Anybody who thinks they, they or their son or their daughter or somebody wants to go out and settle on land in the West, this homestead thing is very appealing. Third, un, as I said before, unlike the abolitionists, the free soilers say nothing about the rights of free blacks. Nothing about, not, a, not in the South, not in the North. Abolitionists had fought for the right of blacks to vote in the North. Free soilers do not talk about that. They sever 
political anti-slavery from racial egalitarianism. This is precisely what William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist, who opposed going into politics, that was one of the reasons he opposed it. He said, if you go into politics, you are going to compromise your principles. Politics is the realm of compromise. The point of abolitionism is to take a powerful moral position and stick with it. It's not to attract votes. We're always going to be a minority, but we want to change opinion. This is what the Free Soil Party represents, that that is happening. On the other hand, Frederick Douglass, the great black abolitionist, attended the Free Soil Party convention, and he and other black abolitionists thought it was a step forward, that the mobilization of people against the South, even in this indirect way, was a very important step forward. Well, Van Buren carried about 20% of the Northern vote, which wasn't too bad for a party founded in August, two or three months before the November election of 1848. Um, and John C. Calhoun, a very, very perceptive observer of American politics, thought the Free Soil Party was posed a great danger to the South. He knew they'd never get elected, but he, he wrote, a man like Van Buren, who was you know, a central figure in the political system of the Jacksonian era, would never have consented to be placed in that position unless he was convinced that the North had determined to rally on this great question. In other words, what, what the Free Soul Party shows is that the abolitionist agitation is having an effect. It is creating a public opinion receptive to anti-slavery politics. Not a majority by any means yet, but a significant part of, nor of the Northern uh, electorate now is willing to listen to this kind of uh, appeal. The election in the South was also very significant. Um, even though the Democrats were really the majority party in the South, Zachary Taylor carried a majority of the Southern states. Why? because he was a slave owner. In fact, in, in other words, a significant number of Southern Democrats voted for Taylor, the slave owner, rather than Cass, the Democrat who was from Michigan. And this reinforced in the North, among many Democrats, a feeling that Southern, their Southern compatriots could not be trusted. One Democrat from Indiana wrote, professed Democrats there in the South deserted us by the thousands permitting us to be defeated in states upon which we relied. Why this desertion? Not because the political principles of the opposing candidate, were General Taylor, were consonant with their views, but because he was one of them, a slave owner. They, pr they sacrificed principles to slavery. Whether that is correct or not, that was a perception which was growing in among certain quarters of the Northern Democratic Party.